It's called the Super Retina Display. In about a month here, some of you guys are gonna be watching these videos on the iPhone 10. Went ahead and did a little optimization here. And much of it is packed right up here into this tiny little area at the top of the display. We call this the True Depth Camera System. That doesn't go away. Gonna to wanna to take advantage of the deeper pixels. There's also the proximity sensor, the ambient light sensor, the speaker and microphone, all packed into this. Watching you watching a video. Let's go. I don't know about you, but I'm already seeing deeper pixels. So this is interesting. I'm getting like this series of postcards. They're all abstract. They never come at once. They dribble in like once a week or something. This is monsoon number four from INTJ Photo. And the mail workers actually have noticed this. They're like, you got another one in the series? And I'm like, oh, okay. And so um, I'll put these together with the stuff that I've got in the back there and show these to you next time. Those of you out there who shoot film, have probably heard the big film news this week. There were actually two big news items. Um, one was on Ektachrome. And if you don't recall, earlier this year, I believe it was at CES, um, Kodak announced that they would be bringing Ektachrome back. This postcard comes from SP, at Sodic Photography on Tumblr and Instagram. Hi Ted, I am an architectural slash urban photographer in New York City and I recently went to the Empire State Building Observatory for the first time in many years that I have been here. But anyway, I made some postcards from my favorite shots from the ground and immediately thought of you. What is your opinion on watermarks? I ask this because it seems to me that people either love them or hate them. Um, honestly, not a big fan. You know, I understand completely why people want to watermark their images, but I'm purist when it comes to photography and I just, anything that is not part of the actual image, I don't think needs to be on it at all. And what really annoys me is when people are so in love with their logo that they stamp it so big on the photograph, it's just, it, it's, it's all a distraction. Just my opinion. SP, I love it. So it was announced back in January that Kodak were going to be bringing back Ektachrome in Q4 of 2017, selling this in 35 millimeter and Super 8 formats, which is kind of interesting. And there was going to be kind of this lab thing where you could return your film and get it processed for the eight millimeter. I guess this was Petapixel where I saw this, but I guess the plan right now is that there will be a limited release, whatever that means, of Ektachrome in Q4 2017, and then a full scale production ramp up in 2018. I'm telling you guys, if they actually bring back Ektachrome and Super 8, I'm ready to fire this up. This is a Canon 1014 XLS, which at the time was like a really incredible Super 8 video camera. This one works. I just need to get some film and shoot on it. I could start filming the art of photography in Super 8. Probably not, but I would like to shoot something with it. Remove tape and unfold to read. Got to exercise some care on this one. Oh, he literally means remove the tape. Well, I'm tearing it. Extra careful. Whoa. Okay, so this is a card. It's a picture of a car, and this is from Shane. And when you remove the tape, Okay, this is pretty funny. I swear I did not plan this. I just did the little segment on Ektachrome and he actually asked me a question in here. He's been mainly shooting on 35 millimeter and 120 film formats. He's collecting old cameras. And he asked me in here, do you think that with Kodak's renewal of Ektachrome manufacturing, that we may even start seeing the possibility of these film formats returning even in smaller batches? You know, I think anything's possible. I think the trick that all these people are gonna have, and we've said this on the show before, and my friend Dave Bias, who works for Ferrania, doing them in small batches 
it, it's such a meticulous process to set up and it works better in volume. But I think personally that anything can be tackled. That's just an obstacle. And so if there are enough people that want to shoot film, someone will figure a way to get film out. I think it's a pretty exciting time for film. Shane, thanks for the picture and the note, and for timing your ectochrome question. Might as well talk about the other film news item, which is that Polaroid is back. And this is actually kind of exciting. Polaroid, obviously the most famous name when it comes to instant film, and the company went bankrupt, I think it was in 2001, their CEO went to jail, and around 2008 or so, they stopped making instant film. They made knickknacks, and they made picture frames. They made that cube thing. So after they stopped making film, a company called The Impossible Project kind of took the reins on this and they bought the last remaining factory that produced Polaroid film and I think they own the patents on some of the film recipes and such. Impossible Project, I think, it, all things considering, have done a fine job with this. I got really tired of Impossible Project because rather than abandoning films that wouldn't work, they would sell them as conceptual films like Fade to Black when the fixture didn't work and stuff like that. And it burnt me out a little bit on shooting instant film in general. But that aside, I think Impossible have done an interesting job of keeping this alive in the interim. Now the big news is that Polaroid have actually acquired the Impossible Project and they are going to start making film under the name Polaroid once again. They have a new camera called the One Step Two. One Step Two, it sounds like a dance move. Along with the dancing camera, Polaroid has decided to start a subdivision of its company called Polaroid Originals, which will be making film for these cameras that will be known as iType. And the, it's interesting that the I in iType stands for incredible. I guess it's no longer impossible. This is possibly the ugliest camera in the world. Very shiny. This is my Polaroid SX70. And this is a camera that I bought probably around 2005-ish when you could still get film for these. The original film, the Time Zero was still available. Time Zero had this emulsion that would take a while to set. And so you could actually do these effects with it. You could go back over it with a spoon or you could heat it up and you could get things to swirl around. People like to do that. Time Zero was actually really good film and the SX70 was a great camera. You've got two controls on here. You've got manual focus you've got this contrast dial which is basically setting the exposure to either underexpose or overexpose and then you can press the shutter button and it, everything's done with the little crosshair circle rangefinder thing in the viewfinder. When I bought mine and I bought it used it had a black covering on it and the black leatherette and it was coming apart it was really disgusting. You'd pick it up and you'd have black goo on your hands and stuff so I knew I needed a replacement so I found a guy on eBay that made these skins that you could get for your Polaroid that would you know in various finishes you could get the tan or you could get the black leather and then they had this option for this cowboy gold and I could not resist and uh, I think I may not be able to resist actually removing this and starting over. Not one of my finer design choices. Next up, we have some zines. These come to us from Zanda Mylanis, who says, thanks for the feature a few months ago. That's right, he sent zines in before. Thought you may be interested in our new stuff from Postcode Patriot Art Collective. Thanks for the zine, Zanda, very cool. Next up is this wonderful book called Click, and this comes to us from Dale Bolin. And Dale writes, each year for the past 25 years, my girlfriend's employer has organized the photo contest open to its employees. Cash prizes are awarded for the winners in each category, and more interesting is that the company publishes this multi-hundred page book of submissions. Then, in celebration of St. Geordie's Day, the company distributes the book and a rose to each of its thousands of employees around the world. Two interesting notes in here. Dale says that the company is Griffles SA, which is a Spanish headquartered healthcare company, and St. Geordie is the patron saint of the region of Spain, Barcelona, where Griffles is located. To celebrate St. Geordie's Day, people exchange roses and books. Dale, thank you for sharing the book with all of us. Love it. Folks, the Day of Reckoning has come for me. This is a book that has come to us from, I'm going to try and pronounce this correctly, Sinov. Now, the reason I'm calling this the Day of Reckoning is Sinov G. Solberg has been a big fan of the show for a long time. We have exchanged comments on social media. I'm probably sounding like an idiot trying to pronounce your name, and I'm really sorry about that, but I am excited about this. This book is about myself. Years and years with chronic fatigue syndrome has put a book with photos I have taken. Ups and downs, sorrows, and happy moments. The good thing about CFS is that you can stay on the sofa, edit photos, create projects, order prints, and books. When I feel up to it, I get out with my camera 
camera, I love to feel the flow when ideas and inspiration come to mind. I feel like a complete fool that I cannot pronounce your name correctly, but thank you for sharing this. This is really amazing. There's some wonderful work in here. And I love hearing stories when people have instances where art or photography have introduced a sort of therapy into their lives. And I think that shows the real power behind all this stuff that we do. This is absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. Next up is this package, which comes to us from Stanislav, who is a Ukrainian photographer. So this is Grey World by Stanislav July. This is very interesting. Stanislav said, I was born in a small town in Ukraine. During my childhood and teens, I was surrounded by people who are not interested in fighting for their dreams because of social judgments and fear and risk. Anyway, he goes on over time to say that he'd studied to become a banker, moved to London, and in seeing the world and the diversity that exists, he writes, and suddenly I understood that I wasn't wrong with the world is diverse. I failed my final exams on purpose and moved to Rigva, Latvia. And sometimes I go to Israel because the people are amazing. There is no right or wrong time for chasing personal desires because it's what's inside the heart that's true. Even against all odds, fear, weakness, or people, no dream should be abandoned because it is worth fighting, failing, and succeeding. Stanislav, this is a beautiful book, beautiful words, and thank you for sharing this with everyone. Okay, we are making a dent in this mail situation in the other room. If you guys want to send something in to share, my address is in the show description. Right now, I gotta clean this up. Hit the like button or subscribe or something. Go watch another video. I'll see you in the next one. Later.